Welcome to this uh, celebration of the resurrection and of Basil's participation in it. I'd like to take just a moment to welcome a few particular people or groups who have joined us today, whom we uh, thank so much for coming. Uh, there is, of course, his beloved family, and uh, besides his excellency, Bishop McManus, we have so many priests, evidently, I suppose, from the diocese and elsewhere. We have one of the members of the Board of Trustees, uh, Michael Moran of the Mastery Foundation that Basil instituted to bring the contemplative life into the dimension of, of uh, the active ministries. It's still going strong. We have also Roseanne Elder, who uh, is the editor of Cistercian uh, Publications. Basil initiated this project from uh, absolute zero in the, uh, in the 60s and enabled uh, Cistercians in the English language to be able to benefit from translations of all the fa Cistercian fathers. And we, we have representatives here of uh, contemplative outreach, which is the fruit of the Centering Prayer Movement that Basil initiated with, uh, in the mid-70s with a couple of other monks of St. Joseph's Abbey. So, we're, we're immersed in a number of, of significant traditions and which, uh, that Basil initiated and which uh, are reflecting his, his enormous capacity for creativity. Uh, he would come into, uh, into a room and all eyes would focus on this enormous presence, the gorgeous beard and overflowing with energy and sympathy and compassion for everyone. He wanted so much to love everybody, but not everybody was responsive. And it must be said that sometimes his love was a little overpowering. <laughs> but he, he thought big. And he was in the tradition of Dom Edmund Futterer, uh, the, the founder of this monastery and the whole uh, Spencer system, which has monasteries in this country. South America, and even uh, helped to establish the, the wonderful growth of the Sturgeon uh, nuns in this country and beyond. So Basil was somebody who would jump on the bandwagon of any great idea that could bring Sturgeon life around the world. And in fact, he really wanted to, to fill the world, not just with Sturgeons, since that would be impossible, and perhaps not a good idea. <laughs> but he wanted to fill it with people who were on the, the transformative journey into Christ, who, who, who ha have been deprived of the full knowledge and practice of contemplative prayer as laypersons. I think the Second Vatican Council opened up this possibility of the full participation of lay people in the life of the church, and it's reflected in the various lay ministries that are cropping up all over the place nowadays. But, but above all, it was inevitable that the lay persons would get the message that they also are called to contemplative prayer and the fullness of the Christian life and transformation into Christ. This, this is uh, what it means to be called to the perfection of holiness, which is not a lot of particular observances or acts, but is a transformation of the heart and our mind and our soul into the love of Christ. And, and Basil thought in those terms. Now he brought with him to all of these projects and to his own monastic life this exuberant and, and sometimes exaggerated response to what needed to be done. But at least he was there whenever you wanted to get something done. And, and he was a tremendous help to me in the early days of my uh, abbatial experience in which I was in the process of making uh, any serious mistakes, that he uh, protected me at least from a few of them through his knowledge of canon law. He, he was, has a degree in theology, in canon law, and he was prepared to have a degree in anything that would be useful for the growth of the church. 
Well, he regarded Dom Edmund as his spiritual father, and this was one of the great uh, qualities of Dom Edmund. He, he, he was a, a person orientated abbot in the most, uh, uh, in a most significant way. And he thought of bringing Cistercian life to South America and to other parts of this country. And, and he was a truly a spiritual father, in the full sense of that word. And so this was Basil's model. And both of these great men were naturally gifted as what might be called, in corporate language, empire builders. <laughs> they were prepared to bring the, the experience of Spencer to every Cistercian foundation that they were allowed to de develop, uh, both men and women. And, and Dom Edmund was one of those leaders who, who recognized his own limitations and could delegate enormous responsibility to what he called his team. I might just remind the community, those of you who uh, uh, have been here a while, that, that, that this is the model that Basil was imitating, it seems to me at least. Uh, there were four major figures that we should never forget in the building of this monastery and in all of its foundations. And, and the first one was the brilliant brother Leo Gregory, who raised the money for all of this. He was a genius in, in going out and reaching the hearts of, of people who could contribute. He was a, a, a significant witness to monastic life that blew people away when they ran into this wonderful young monk. There was brother Blaise Drayton, who was a genius, uh, brilliant in every way in architecture, organization. And there was Brother Girard, who built this thing. He was the sort of the overall organizer of this monastery and its construction, the monastery in Snowmass and the one in Azul. None of this could have happened without those three men. Brother Blaise designed those other monasteries, and basically this one with the help, of course, of, of the trained people here, like Father, like, uh, uh, Father Lawrence Bourget. But we have here a very dynamic group of people who are unquestionably moved by the Spirit of God, and, it's, it, it, and, and Basil really represented the, a possible second generation of these people. Other things happened that required our attention, like the Second Vatican Council, all of the reforms in the order and in the monastery, these things uh, Basil took a vigorous part in. But you know, Dom Edmund left behind more than just a series of accomplishments. At the peak of his career, he was in a serious airplane accident, and a few years later, he resigned as abbot of Spencer, and after several brief stops, went to Azul, Argentina, where he spent the rest of his life, in which he experienced the diminishment of his enormous capacities to build, to create, to bring uh, gifted people into vital contact to produce uh, enormous results. Well, you know what happened to Dom Edmund? He suffered incredible uh, interior trials. First of all, he couldn't do Spanish, but he wanted to stay out of the way. And so he, he gradually uh, experienced without as he told me, any consolations. The diminishments of self that Teilhard de Chardin speaks about. In other words, God gave him the great grace of experiencing not just accomplishment, but the healing or purification 
of the enormous creative energies that he had and of his talents. The ultimate best use of talents seems to be to sacrifice them. You may not like to hear this, but I'm afraid that that is the truth. And it's in letting go and allowing the divine process of gradual humiliation and powerlessness to enter our lives. And Dom Edmund died in that dark night. And I think this is what happened to Basil. His, his enormous creative abilities needed the purification process that he evidently underwent in the last year or two when his desire to be a, a spiritual father in the mold of Dom Edmund, when his desire to, cre to creatively bring the contemplative life and practice into the world of, of the laypersons, this <laughs> had to be purified. It had to be brought into contact with the interior humiliation and purification of being just another human being. And so Basil, it seems to me, presents each of us, especially monks who are called in a unique way to the fullness of the transformative process into Christ. It means you can't win. It means you have to let go of everything that you've treasured and loved in your ministry, in your role, in your thoughts, in your talents. Jesus suggests this in that wonderful saying, which I think is rather weakly translated in some translations, but there's a, a, a North American Bible that preceded the present liturgical text and was used in the liturgy says this. It's the text that says, if you, lose your, uh, if you gain your life, you lose it. If you lose it, you will win it. But the text suggests something vastly more profound. It goes like this in that text. One who seeks to bring his life, accomplishments, talents, self-image, to save or preserve that life will bring himself to ruin. But one who brings himself to nothing will find out who he is. From what I've heard of Basil's purgatory, as some are calling it, frankly, I think it's not purgatory, but hell that he went through crushed beyond belief in this car accident. In the last two weeks before his death, he was in a conference with the doctors and, and, and his superiors here, or other monks, as, as to what plan was laid out for him. There was little hope of his recovering, his capacity to walk or to breathe or to talk. And he fully accepted that plan of rehabilitation and he said, as one of the monks told me, I turn myself over completely to Jesus and Mary and God's will for me. They performed the tracheotomy that meant he couldn't speak anymore. Can you imagine what it is for a man who's a kind of artesian well of wisdom in every direction to not even be able to say, boo! <coughs> Here's a man with such tremendous physical energy, a great swimmer, lying on a bed for 67 days, virtually unable to move a muscle. This is not an ordinary sickness. Neither was the illness of Lazarus, a portion of which we read about in the Gospel. Uh, Lazarus wound up where? In the tomb. What image does that conjure up? Utter powerlessness, death, loneliness, loss of everything loved, friends, nobody's going to join you in a tomb. The damp, dark nature of tombs. All of these suggest the interior corruption that the dark nights or the 
intimate purification of divine love brings about in those with the courage like Basil to say an unmitigated yes to whatever happens. His last words, as far as I know, on the day of his death, when the doctor offered him another operation to try to save his, preserve his life, he said, I've had enough. Take out the ventilators, which mean, he knew meant certain death. To me, this suggests coming to the very bottom and pit of interior desolation, loneliness, perhaps depression, the powerlessness of which there is no human word to describe. Death really is the birth channel into eternal life. It's the redoing of our original struggle to be born into this world with its difficulties. The more difficulty in getting through that canal, the greater the share there probably is in the divine life. So that in losing everything, his talents, capacities, even the possibility of speaking, Basil entered into the actual fullness of his capacity for leadership. And perhaps we'll see in the future a greater appreciation of his books and tapes and ministry, which extended into Asia, Australia, and Africa. He's ready to go anywhere, even to Antarctica, but nobody invited him there. <laughs> but but, but what, what Basil is modeling for us now is the most sublime kind of leadership, the kind of leadership that goes with Christ's passion, death, and don't forget it, descent into hell. It's in the creed. You can never take it out of there. It means there's a place worse than death that we can participate in even in this life. And some people are in that place even now through various trials, oppression, poverty, all those horrors. But there's an interior symbolism of these external trials that seem to be crystallized or capitulated in his last words. Like Job. I've had enough. But it has to be balanced with what he said two weeks earlier. I give myself over completely to God's will and the love of Jesus and Mary, whom, as you know, he had great tenderness for. But this isn't just a love of devotion. This is a sublime participation in the sufferings of Christ and of Mary that he understood with his brilliant intellect and, and taught in his grasp of Lexio Divina, the prayerful study of scripture and, and his practice of, of meditation. What's left in the tomb when all of your uh, self-identities, one's role, one's beloveds, one's talents, one's thoughts, one's feelings, one's body are no longer possible to identify with. Now there's just you, the true self, whoever the hell you are. And to be able to accept that is to enter into eternal life, trusting the boundless, boundless confidence, the infinite mercy of God. As far as I can see, there is no other possession in this world worth having except that one. If you have the infinite mercy of God, you don't need everything, anything else. And this is Basil's invitation to follow him as he followed Dom Edmund into the purgatorial fires, and I suggest a real brush with the ultimate interior desolation or hellishness of the feeling of alienation from God or the paralysis that can't make any acts of love or thought because one is, is, is crushed by 
suffering, pain, and pain killers. To me, Basil emerges now in, in all of his desires to be a spiritual father that were somewhat frustrated during his life, at least to the extent that he probably envisaged it. What he now has is servant leadership, the capacity to lead out of powerlessness. And this, I suggest, is the most effective, or will be, form of leadership in the world today. People have had enough of pride, pretension, power, and especially violence. And in this way, as Jesus destroyed violence by submitting to it, Basil enters into the fullness of his of his, the grace of childhood as a cell in the mystical body of Christ each of us has the total program a kind of divine DNA of transformation in Christ through the theological virtues and the fruits and gifts of the spirit it's all sitting there in us we just think it isn't there but it's there ready to be activated through contemplative prayer and the practice of the service of others and so Basil, following Jesus and Mary, invites us into that depth of purification, which is especially intense for very talented people, but which will also free their gifts for the fullness of their expression in whatever happens in what we call eternal life. So as we celebrate Basil's transition or transformation or final liberation. Let's invite all the deceased members of our beloved community at Spencer and, uh, and everybody who has benefited from its, from its spiritual riches to join us with their prayers and their singing, if they can sing, to make of this experience today a corporate celebration of the great men who have served St. Joseph's Abbey.